In this video, I'm going to show you how you can change and modify the initial directors configuration. This video is a continuation of the Node NPM directors installation. If you haven't set up your directors project yet, make sure to watch that one first. As you can notice, after you run the npx create directors project command, a lot of files have been created for you. Each directors project supports a number of environment variables for a configuration. These variables are added to the .env file and by changing it, you can provide your project with more flexibility and granularity. As you can see right here, we already have some configuration options set up by the installer. So most likely you won't have to change these. Here are some of the general settings like the port and public URL. Below, we have some database settings such as database client, host, port, database, user, and the password. You've chosen all of these during the installation process, so you won't have to change them here. Now, let's take a look at other, more intricate settings. Before starting, I'm going to tell you about two really useful links. Both are going to be mentioned somewhere along this video. First one is this one. This is the example env file with all the default settings. So if you need to change something, you can reference to here. And the second really useful file I want to share with you is this one. Here, you can find additional information about each one of these settings. Going back to the code, just for reference, I'm going to put the .env.example on the right side so we can see them both at the same time. Remember, this configuration on the left is our current one. And now, allow me to briefly go through all of these settings so that you know if there's something you might want to change. Let's take a look at security first. So we're going to scroll down all the way to security. This key right there is the unique identifier for your project. The secret is just a secret string for your project. It is generated on the installation. This access token TTL simply specifies the duration that the access token is valid. In this case, it is 15 minutes. You can change that freely. Just below, we have the duration that the refresh token is valid and also how long users stay logged in to the app. As you can see, by default, it is set to seven days, but of course you can freely change it. This line right here specifies whether or not to use a secure cookie for the refresh token. By default, that is set to false, and this line right below specifies the value for a site in the refresh token cookie, and in this case, by default, it is set to a string of lax. Now, I want to talk about the concept of course, cross-origin resource sharing. We don't have it in our current file because we are using all the default values for it, but if we go ahead and look into the example right here, you can see we have all the options for course. We can enable it and that is done by default. And then you can specify the course methods, allowed headers, exposed headers, credentials, and the max age. But again, all of this is set by default, so you don't even have to change anything in your ENV. We are moving on to rate limiting. By default, rate limiter store is set to memory, but you can also use Redis or memcache. Based on the rate limiter used, you must also provide additional configurations. For example, for Redis, you can see right there, you have to specify all of these options. The most important part being the Redis connection string. Alternatively, you can enter individual connection parameters like so. And again, for memcache, you have to use this. And that brings us to the topic of cache. In here, you can choose whether or not caching is enabled. By default, it is set to false. If you, if you do choose to enable it, then you have to specify following parameters. Cache TTL specifies how long the cache is persisted. By default, that is set to 30 minutes. Cache namespace specifies how to scope the cache data. By default, it is director's cache. And then finally, you can choose where to store the cache data. You can store it either in the memory, Redis, or the memcache. As with the rate limiter, based on the cache used, you must also provide these configurations. So if you're using Redis, you have to provide either this or these for manual, and for memcache, you have to provide this. That would be it for caching. Let's move to file storage. 
By default, storage locations is set to local, but you can also provide it a CSV of storage locations. For example, local, comma, DigitalOcean, comma, Amazon. You can use any names you'd like for these keys, but each must have a matching location configuration. Right below, you can see the example with the S3 DigitalOcean. You have to specify all of these parameters. Here's also the example with Google Cloud Storage. Moving to all auth. By default, there are no all auth providers, but you can specify a list of the ones you want to use. In this case, you can see we're using GitHub, for example, and Facebook. Therefore, for each new one that you add, you have to specify its own configuration. Here's also a small part in regards to extensions. By default, the extensions path is set to dot slash extensions. And as you can see, they are right here. And to the last and final thing, that's going to be email. You can choose the email address from which emails are sent. You can also choose what to use to send emails. You can either use send email or SMTP. Based on the transport you chose, you must also provide these configurations. So if you chose send mail, you must add these configurations. And if you chose SMTP, you have to provide the following configurations. And that would be it for this video. In most cases, you most likely won't have to change anything in your .env. But now you know you can if you need to change something. I strongly advise you to take a look at those two files that are going to be linked. And if you need to make some changes, definitely reference to those.